welcome to Worms and Warriors. You're just about to join me for a brand new campaign on Grand Tactician, The Civil War. This is now the sixth or seventh campaign I'm playing of this game, and it's the first time I'm rolling with the 1.07 beta patch. That is 1.0706 to be precise, this is where we're at. Uh, apparently the 1.07 patch is going to improve the AI considerably. Uh, I've read positive things about this patch on Steam, so I I'm hopeful it's going to be a good one. Uh, we're going to go with a confederate campaign this time round. I've been wondering where to start and, and, and which campaign to do. I did a Union 1861 start previously, just the last campaign that's just finished, which was pretty good. Uh, I think lots of people enjoyed it. It certainly brought in a lot of subscribers. So if you are one of those new subscribers, thank you very much. If you're an older subscriber, then thanks very much as well. That's, I appreciate that. As well as that, if, if you're new here and you like this sort, of, uh, this sort of content, then why not subscribe to the channel and come along for the ride? I'm also currently playing Ultimate General Civil War, which is awesome. It's a great game, that. Uh, even though it's from 2017, it still it holds up really well. It's very enjoyable. Um, and a lot of fun to play. Let me just come out of this and I'm going to set off. I'm going to turn off some of the notifications I've got going on in the background. I can hear uh, Discord bleeping away. I'll just be back in one second. Yeah, so I think that's fixed now. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're back to this. And we're going to start, like I say, with a Confederate campaign. I'm going to start in 61. I had toyed with the idea of starting in 62 or 63, uh, but I think to get a full feel for this new patch, it's probably best to start in the 61 start. Because, like, if you've been following the series, and if you watch other series, then most people tend to start with the 61 start. Uh, and I think that'll be a nice comparison point to go to. So, I'm not. it's not like, it's not going to be a full-on what is 1.07 playthrough it's just if i notice some things that are different i'll point them out if you guys notice while watching anything that's different anything that's better or worse stick it in the comments and we'll, we'll chat through it so uh yeah anyway we're going to get started and we're going to set this game up pretty much uh straight away so like i say we're in 1.0706 it's a new campaign we're going to have a go uh, with this being a first episode, just bear in mind, I will chapter it, so if some of you guys have watched this stuff before, you might not want to watch all the setup. I mean, I'll include some kind of, I don't want to say tutorial, but maybe some hints and tips and things that, that I've been doing in this game that have worked pretty well. I mean, I'm not saying I'm an expert at this game, but I have like, got, I don't know, 250 hours in or something. So I've definitely played it a bit. So anyway, let's, let's get started. So let's, we're going to go with this. We're going to go as... The uh, Confederacy, of, we don't want that. We're going to start in summer of 61. Spring 61, I'm not a fan of. I, I did start in spring 61 with the previous Confederate campaign, but in all honesty, it was a bit waste of time at the start of the, at the, start of the campaign. And I found that the Union AI didn't use their fleets at all, didn't blockade us. It was just, it was a bit crap, really, if I'm honest. So anyways, we're going to start in July the 8th, 1861, over by Christmas which was a fairly common held view on both sides i think at the start of the war that this was going to be a quick war it's going to be like we've got to get in there and get some glory uh before the war is over so anyway so we're going to keep the ai on historic we're not going to go very easy we're going to go on very hard um aggressiveness now this is one of those things right so last the last campaign i played very hard and elevated i feel like the ai was too aggressive too rash and pushed too much basically it's just it, it, it kept it kept attacking even when there was not really any chance of gaining victory i wonder if maybe the mediocre aggressiveness would give the ai a helping hand rather than making them attack constantly if you know what i mean or would that make them too timid i really don't know i've never tried on mediocre I, at least i can't remember if i did so adjust the AI behavior regarding recruitment activity, oh well, as well as probabilities of invasions and defensive operations. So, I don't know, like, elevated, like, when I played on elevate last time, he just kept attacking me. He would attack me sometimes with 50,000 men if I had 90,000, you know, which really he's got no chance of victory. I, I, I don't know if that's to do with the aggressiveness rating that, that we had it on. Or do we go very high and just see what happens? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm toying with the idea of mediocre. I'll, I'll have a think about it while I'm setting the rest of this crap up. <laughs> right, so 
Old Dominion, uh, we're going to go with that one. Uh, Virginia votes to secede from the Union and will join the Confederacy. The Confederate uh, capital city is moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. Confederate support in Virginia plus 10. Virginia's secession and Richmond's close proximity to Washington, D.C. Come as a shock to the Union citizens. Morale minus five for the Union. So I'm, uh, this one I always go with, really. Um... King Cotton as well. I, I usually go with that one. Uh, all plantations will start the campaign with a higher upgrade level. Support in all slave states plus five, which obviously is quite handy. European intervention level plus 20. This policy is required for level three and four agriculture policies during the campaign. Uh, native allies. Now, this is one I usually take off. So approach the Native Americans to ally with them against the northern oppressors. Confederate support in Indian territory plus 25%. Recruitment from many of the Indian tribes living there is made possible, and the number of volunteers is doubled. Now, is that really worth it? I mean, I don't doubt that the native troops are, are good and handy, uh, but I don't think it's it's really one we want to go with. Well, the one I want to go with is industrialization, which is what I'm going to go with. All heavy industry will start the campaign with a higher upgrade level. The Confederacy will start the campaign with more railroad lines built. Immigration from Europe increases population within the Confederacy by 25%, but lowers unity due to religious unrest and resentment towards slavery within the immigrant population, reducing national morale by minus 5. This policy is required for level 3 and 4 industrialization policy and the abolition of slavery later in the campaign. I think we're going to go with that one. I do like that one. Philly Bustering. Provide support to large-scale southern incursions into Latin America. Southern military experience is increased by plus five. Cuba will be under southern control, increasing trade and allowing recruitment. recruitment. So that, that, that's another one that could be interesting, I think. Getting some Cuban guys into our army, but I think I will leave it. <clears throat> Apostles of Disunion. Official support for the pro-slavery fire eaters will increase southern support in all slave states by plus 20, but will also increase northern support in all free states by plus 10. I mean, yeah, I can see why this would be handy one to have as well. Slavery to the West. Encourage pro-slavery pioneers to settle in Arizona and New Mexico territories. Southern support in the territories plus 25, population plus 25%, and recruitment allowed. But can't we recruit anyway in Arizona and New Mexico? No, I don't recall. I think we can. Trade capacity from Texas to the West States and territories doubled. And due to the increased trade volumes, all ports in Texas start with a higher upgrade level. Again, it's, it's probably a pretty damn good one. Kansas, a slave state. Organize pro-slavery immigration and cross-border incursions into the Kansas Territory. Southern support in Kansas, plus 25. And it will become a slave state. Southern support in all slave states plus 5%. So again, it's, it's probably handy. Uh, but I think we'll go with these. O the Old Dominion, King Cotton, and Industrialization. Uh, what do you normally go with when you play this game? What What's your policy choices for the Confederacy? It's, I'd be interested to hear that. Um, but yeah, anyway, so... Basically, when we were starting on July the 8th, we were starting with the war just kicking off. So basically, what happens is we'll do, we'll do the setup in this series, uh, in this episode, ready for the series to go, and we'll take it from there. And I think, yeah, I think we're going to go very hard. Uh, I don't know. I, I, think, I feel like maybe I'm gimping if I go mediocre, but then I don't want to... I don't want him to come and attack me constantly on Elevated. Not because I don't want to be attacked, but because I think it's just it's a waste of his time. It'll make it harder for him. But, uh, yeah, let's do it. We'll go very hard on Elevated. Let me know what you think in the comments if you've got any opinion on that. Uh, but I, th I think that's the way to go. And we'll keep him on Historic. Um, order delays. Yeah, that's we'll play with that. I like that bit of realism. Fog of War, of course. Readiness system. Yep, again, I like that. Uh, you can't just keep marching the whole time. Feuds, I... Not bother about feuds. It it harms the AI's chances and it makes it a bit more difficult for yourself. I find the feuds quite unrealistic. Like fair enough, obviously officers won't be feuding with each other. That's fine. But it has stupid little things like if you give long range orders, the officers won't change to that kind of thing. And it's just like, are you serious? Anyway, I don't need that in my life. <laughs> so yeah. Auto manage, no thanks. We'll manage that ourselves. Uh, I may set some things to auto manage, but I don't want everything defaulted as auto management. <clears throat> Excuse me, 
So we're going to start morale 95 for both sides. Experience 8 for them, 9 for us, so slightly higher. Which reflects, I think, the more martial traditions of the South, maybe. I'm not entirely sure why exactly that is slightly higher. Or maybe just because we've won a couple of more battles uh, pre pre-start. Not sure. It could, probably is that, actually. Um, number of ships, we start with 35. They start with 75. We've got Confederate Momentum. Um, they start with an army of 75,000. We start with an army of 50,000, which we, obviously we will increase. Um, yeah, so we're pretty much ready to go here. We're ready to rock and roll. And like I say, this video will be chaptered. So if you don't want to watch these next bits where I'm doing the setting up and I'm putting the fort garrisons in and stuff like that, if you do want to watch that, then that's great, obviously. Uh, if you don't, feel free to skip. Uh, that's uh, totally fine, obviously. I do understand that lots of people have probably watched this kind of stuff again and again, but we are in the new beta release here, the 1.0706. Um, so there might be some new things. I, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I have read, like I say, I have read positive things about the AI, and I like anything that's positive for this game. So hopefully we're going to see some improvements from the 1.06. I did enjoy the last few campaigns, but there are definitely some niggling things that the developers need to work on, and I'm sure are working on, but I mean, it's easy to say these things, isn't it? Uh, it's another thing to probably implement them in game and make it work with what you've already done and stuff. It's, but anyway, I do appreciate these guys who uh, are working on this game still, even though it's been on full release for some time now. It's It's pretty good um but yeah so we're going to roll summer 61 confederacy good old jeff davis uh we're going to take on abe lincoln and his seventy-five thousand guys plus the hundreds of thousands more he'll recruit and we're going to get started right away so just while this is loading in i just want to say a couple of words on grand tactician content in general and and um strategy gaming content in general i know i plug his channel all the time but why not go and check out brambra if you're not familiar with him brambra's channel i'll link it in the description here at the end of the video when i well, when i've recorded the video go and check his stuff out he's awesome yeah um, i mean we've got a a nice little community going on here like lots of people who watch his channel watch mine and you know it's it, it's quite nice um slightly different style of play but go and check him out Another dude who I know who plays Grand Tactician as well is J76NY. Check him out. I'll, I'll link him as well. Again, a different play style, but well worth watching if you're into this sort of content. So we're going to have the chapter video here, which I don't think I'm going to leave on because, I mean, I'm sure all you guys have seen this. It's just, it's just the intro video setting up the scene. Okay, then. So on first glance, immediately, it looks the same. The troop numbers are the same, obviously. I mean, there's... I didn't expect that to have changed. What, I've, what I'm really hoping for change here is mostly just the uh, AI mechanics. All right, then. So like I said, this will be chaptered. And if you don't want to watch all this stuff, then feel free to skip now. <laughs> but I'm, first off, we're going to set up the armies. Now, I do this kind of thing every time. This is I, I make up divisions in the armies, basically. I, had, I don't normally show this part, but I thought maybe... Maybe some people might be interested to see what we've got going on. So the very first thing I always do is I'll set our forces up with division. So if we have a quick look, like so this is the Army of the Potomac under Beauregard. Brigadier General Beauregard. And we've got a whole bunch of divisions under him, basically. And, and I don't want that. I want... I want uh, not division, sorry, brigades, individual brigades. We've got Bonham's Brigade, Ewell's Brigade, Jones Brigade, Longstreet's Brigade, uh, Cox Brigade, or Coke. I'm not sure how to say that name. Probably Coke. <laughs> I'm sure he would say Coke. Early, Evans, Holmes, you know, the usual guys. It's all the same dudes. Um, we're going to make divisions instead. I want Longstreet to have a division, so we're going to replace Longstreet. Let's uh, replace him with William H.T. Walker. He's going to have that. Uh, he's going to have this brigade, the 4th brigade. And I'm going to set this up, not bait. We're going to give that to Longstreet. So Longstreet's going to get a division right away. And it's going to be an infantry division. Let's have a quick look at these guys. Actually, Walker might have been a good one to give another division to, if I'm honest. Rosser looks pretty good as well. The only majors. All right, so yeah, I'm actually going to give him uh, another division. So let's find another commander, uh, Loring. Yeah, he'll be fine. 
Um, we're then going to go ahead and give Walker that division. So we're just going to have two larger divisions. I had toyed with the idea there of keeping the artillery separate, but really we've only got uh, a handful of guns. Uh, 28, is it? Yeah, 28 guns. So we'll just attach them to the brigades, and if we need to, we'll detach them for the battle and move them separately. Um, that'll be just as easy. So we're going to have two larger brigades here. Longstreet's... Uh, I keep saying brigades. I mean divisions. <laughs> two, two divisions here. Longstreet's division and Walker's division, okay? And we'll, we'll expand this more as time goes by. Next up, we're going to have a look at the Shenandoah Force. This is Joe Johnson's army. Core. These are core-sized armies because we haven't done the organisation reform yet. We're going to give Jackson a division, so let's replace him. With us, he's going to take charge. Jackson's got some nice stats already there. Let's give Kirby Smith another division. We'll replace him as well. Not much in the way of choices there, is there? And then Brigadier Generals. <laughs> there we go. Hill. AP Hill. We've got a tiny cavalry unit under Jeb Stewart. But that's that for now. So this is uh, the two main armies sorted out. Hampton Division. I think that's just one brigade for now under Magruder. Yeah, it's two brigades. Uh, we've got Daniel Hill. I'm going to replace him, actually, because I will put somebody uh, worse in there. What about this guy? No. <laughs> we'll keep him for a fort, I think. He'll do. He'll do. Uh, we'll, keep, we'll give Hill a different command. It's unlikely that Magruder's guys are going to be in the combat any time. Uh, in the in the near future, uh, Army of the Northwest again. This is just a brigade. It's thirteen hundred and twenty men. Well, it's a couple of brigades, but like they're, they're tiny, like little regiments really. And one artillery battery. So we're going to leave those guys alone. Um, who else have we got here? The Western Army under McCullough or McCulloch. I'm not sure maybe how you say it. I think I interchange between the two. We've got uh, a brigade under Pierce, the Arkansas troops. We've got the Arkansas Mounted Rifles under Macintosh and some guns under Woodruff Jr. Ooh. Let's see if we can't find somebody decent with artillery experience to put in there. He's pretty good, but... Shoot, maybe? Let's go with Jones. So we don't really need to do anything with these guys because uh, it's just such a small force anyway. But what we will do is, just while I remember, we're going to move him up to uh, Fayetteville where we'll be constructing a depot um, and we're going to bring the Missouri State Guard back into here as well actually because we don't need to be in Missouri just yet we will push up into there um, but let's have a look at Price's force I think he starts the division under Reigns that's right yeah Reigns is pretty poor but I think he becomes a little better we'll just keep him in place for now I don't want to carve in there though Yeah, let's get Hill. Hill can have the second division here. These are real small units again, 600 men. Waitman's got 1,300. And as we can see, the weapons suck, so we'll be working on weapons uh, increases as well. But that's, that may be something I do between episodes. But anyway, so here we are. So we've got the, the West set up. Um, in terms of troops for this central region in Tennessee here, we've got some guys at Nashville under Polk. Uh, again, just 1,600, so it's not really, like, it's not, not a massive force. A division under Pillow. Pillow sucked in real life, but actually he turns out okay, usually in game. Um, Polk as well. I, I don't know, I don't think it makes that much difference, if I'm perfectly honest, who you've got in charge. Like, Preston Smith looks like he's crap, but, I mean, I'm sure they'll be okay, those guys, if we put them in the combat. <laughs> we'll find out. So let's change the name of this. We'll call it the Tennessee Corps. The Army of Florida down here. Now, these guys are under Bragg. Uh, and I will not be leaving them here. It will be, we'll, I'm going to send them up here as well. And we'll combine those guys together into a, into a, a, a force together. Because we don't really need them there. If we want to, we can raise another force. And we can try and take Fort Pickens at some point in the future. But we don't need to do that just yet. So that's the troops kind of sorted out here. But the next big job is the forts. Now, I heard that they'd fixed this, right? So... Fort Pulaski. Let's 
just have a look. We'll start with one of these ones. Let's sort, start with Fort uh, Clinch. So I've got them selected. So apparently, if you click this now, it takes you there. It does. That's awesome. It didn't used to do that. Now, that, that sounds like a little thing, but that's actually... That it was a proper pain in the arse, this. <laughs> having to find the unit, having to flick through the garrisons, you know, until you found the right one. So what we do here, what, well, what I do here, is I put political officers in charge of these forts. Lots of gamers of this game do that because you get your political bonus for assigning them, but actually there's nobody available. Well, Lieutenant Joseph R. Anderson. Why is it only showing up these two guys? Have I got something else connected, selected? Oh, because I've still got artillery, that's right. Right, so there's a few more. I was going to say. <laughs> um, so what I like to do here is I like to put the kind of dregs of the guys in here. Like, the, the worst that I could find. Because most... I mean, who's... If it comes to the point where we're losing this fort, then probably, you know, we're, we've got serious problems and it's not going to make that much difference if you've got an awesome commander in there as opposed to William W. Adams, who's going to be in there instead. <laughs> fort clinch, there you go. Fort Brook. Again, we're going to replace the generic guy. You know, he's not even that bad, but I want to replace him with the political. And the reason I like to put political dudes in here is because of this little symbol here. Let's have a quick look. This officer has acquired his rank thanks to his political status. Commanding troops increases support in his home state, but he is apt to fuse. But we've got fuse turned off anyway, so it makes no difference. Plus, who's he going to feud with when he's a fort commander? If removed from command, it will it will hurt the support in his state. I had to read that twice. I'm, I'm a little way away from the screen here from where I'm sitting. <laughs> uh, so where's this guy from? So he's from North Carolina, so it would bump up our support in North Carolina, for example. So let's pop him in there. What else we got? Are these, these are all these are Union forts, and this is actually a Union port down here. Bahamas. Cool. Something I'd like to see. One day. <laughs> okay, so let's work through these forts. Yeah, he looks like a good candidate there. John T. Morgan. One star and everything. Where's he from? He's from Alabama. So there you go, sir. This is your new command, Fort McAllister. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through all these forts now. I'll cut this out because I, I really don't think you guys want to see this, do you? You don't want to see every single officer who I'm changing um, but also while we're at it Fort Pulaski so th these guys have got Napoleons so we're going to change that right away oh we can't I thought we'd be able to change this out for six pounders but maybe we can't but anyway so let's bear this in mind we're going to move these guys out of here and into an actual army force because the Napoleons are scarce at this point for sure Mercer um, he's not a political officer so let's replace him Daniel L. Kennan or Keenan. Yeah, from Florida. There you go, sir. Um, yeah, now, what am I doing with these? Am I moving them straight out there? I'll have, I'll, have a, I'll, have a, I'll have a little think about that. But I'm going to go through all these forts now. I'm going to replace the officers who are in there if they're generics like this um, or not political officers. I'll replace them with a political officer and I'll cut back in when that's done. So the slight exception to this rule is that I'm going to put slightly better commanders in forts like Fort Pillow, which is on the Mississippi River. So we're going to stick uh, James A. Walker in there. He's got slightly better stats, and it's likely we'll put, put a little garrison into Fort Pillow as well. Fort Pillow being just here north of Memphis. So it's a quite important fort, actually. So that's where I'll put a proper commander in here, and I'll put a proper commander in these forts as well. I say a proper commander, a better political commander. All right, so I'll get back to it. All right, so that's all the commander sorted out here. It took a little while, but we got there in the end. And I'm sure none of you guys wanted to watch all that. If you did, then apologies, but uh, that's just where it is. So that's that bit sorted out. So let's have a quick look at our policies. Where are we going to go first? My first step is going to be to go for Militia Act 2. Once we've got that, we'll go for Military 2. And we'll work down towards the Conscription Act. 
following on from that will probably work on industry and or government funding, depending on how our money's looking. Um, but Military Act 2 first. Finances. We're doing okay at the moment, of course. We've got 20 million in the bank. We've got interest rates at 7.81. Where our economy's in expansion. That won't last for long, I dare say. Wealth is mediocre, as you would expect. 4.4% unemployment. Well, come on, guys, join the army. National debt at 40 million. And like I say, interest rates at 7.81. Tariffs are at 30%. Sales tax at 5%. We're going to keep it at that. Uh, at the moment, we're making a surplus, but again, that will not last. Uh, we're investing some money into politics, but not very much. A little bit in the economy, a little bit in agriculture, some in the industry, and not very much in the military. We're going to have to change that pretty much immediately. We're going to go into high spending for the military because, you know, we're fighting a war. Diplomacy, let's knock a little bit into this. Just over a million. Um, and so these are our subsidies that will help us with the projects. All these things... Add up new. Oh. So there's some different things here. I didn't, I've never noticed these before. Counter propaganda. I know you could have propaganda, but I didn't know you could have counter propaganda. So that must be a new one, I think, unless I've just missed it previously. Um, another one that pops out here. Artillery reform. Traditional artillery batteries are distributed within an army and attached to infantry brigades or even regiments. The infantry commander is then in command of the attached gunners, usually attaching a few guns sections to operate in different parts of their battle line. This limits the tactical use of artillery in battle. Organizing multiple batteries into battalions or even brigades allows an artillery commander, a specialist in the use of his guns, to manage his batteries to better support his commanders. This project updates all existing artillery units to battalions and allows recruitment of artillery battalions with up to 16 guns. All right, so can we not have that now? You used to be able to do that anyway with a large a large unit. Cavalry reform, cavalry reform too. So these are all new things. Cavalry regiments are traditionally used by the army commander for scouting as messengers or uh, to relay orders or to perform guard duties in the rear in small detachments. Progressive cavalry officers are against this kind of dispersed use and favor more independent cavalry use blah 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 this project updates all existing cavalry units to brigades and allows recruitment of cavalry brigades of up to 2500 troopers so hang on let's just say so let's have a quick look here army potomac let's say we want to recruit a cavalry unit let's have a quick look here is this different recruiting now we've got 47000 recruits available by the way which is nice oh yeah so you can't select the unit size. Now, that is interesting. Oh, no, hang on. What the? That's really cool. So you can only have tiny little units. 500, 250, or 375. What about infantry? 3,000. All right, so that's the same as it used to be. Artillery. Oh, yeah, tiny. That's really interesting. That's really cool. So I, I love this, actually. This is awesome that this has changed like this. So you, you only start with smaller battalions and uh, cavalry units and stuff, and you've got to actually work at making them bigger. That, that's, that's awesome. I love that. The infantry units are still the same. Uh, 1,500 brigades, 2,250 2, or 3,000 man brigades. So, I mean, that's fine. Obviously, the organization of the armies was roughly that. Uh, I know somebody commented recently on one of my other videos saying, uh, talking about sizes of units and that... Um, Civil War Brigades were three to 5,000 men. I don't know if that's true. Um, I'm sure some brigades were probably up to 5,000 men, but I reckon the majority of brigades were probably between 1,500, were probably between 1,000 and 3,000 men. But whatever, I'm no expert. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <clears throat> this is a nice change. I like this. I love that you can only recruit smaller units until you've made the reforms. Let's see if there's anything else new in here. So cavalry reform two. This project allows recruitment of horse artillery type units. Okay, so can we not recruit them now? Whoops. Well, oh no, we can't. It's grayed out. Ah. 
All right, so that's that's cool again. So you've got to work at this stuff. You've really got to put money into this. This is a new one as well, Confederate Guns. The one-pounder Williams gun is designed by Captain D.R. Williams of Covington, Kentucky. Breach load and rapid-fire rifle. Fires up to 40 rounds a minute. The 12 pounder Napoleon is much more liked by Southern Gunners due to the brass shortage, cast iron, but yeah, well, that's okay. That's another cool, nice new little touch. This, they're doing a lot of work on this. French warships, French weapons. I think we had these in the previous one. Improvised shipyards. Legacy rifles, I like that one. Carbines, medium range carbines. Modern warships, organization reform, it's an important one. Rebought muskets, rebuilt iron clads, we've already got that available. Cool. Sharps rifles, supply reform. Yeah, so these are all the same apart from those uh, cavalry reform options. And what was the other one? Uh, was it artillery reform or something? Yeah, artillery reform. Cool. So to get proper larger size units of artillery, we're going to have to put the reform in. Otherwise, you make do with the smaller batteries. Let's have a quick look through here. I mean, I'm not hugely familiar with the civil ones. Uh, let's have a look. Counter program. I'm sure that's new. Cool. Yeah, so we've got some interesting little changes there. Sorry, I was just interrupted, so I've had to cut off and come back on here, um, which doesn't always make for a good flow, but uh, I think it'll be fine. So, yeah, I've replaced all the commanders here. I've put some slightly better commanders into some of these forts. Um, not amazing, obviously, <laughs> but uh, some of the slightly better ones. So we've got Dot Henry defended by uh, Wise. Uh, Henry R. Jackson is in Fort Donaldson. And oh, where's the other one? Hyman is under Ambrose are right because I mean these are key positions basically and Fort Pillow has got James Walker in charge which is again it's an important fort this one it's going to stop the Union ships from coming down it's going to slow down any Union advance we'll garrison this one we'll garrison these three we'll probably build a fort at Nashville on the river as well I think I think that's probably a good plan so anyway my usual way of operating in this game is to have recruitment commands which i call like hq units basically so we'll have one in the east we'll have one in tennessee we'll have one in the trans mississippi that's how i'll roll with it we'll start off we'll have a couple of uh, engineering units as well they'll be the guys who build us our forts and, the, and things like that and stay behind the line now usually i convert those i convert those units into um actual fighting units once i've built what i want to build and then we just have other people building the stuff for us once that happens uh, usually like in the 62 is when i'll start to convert those engineering units so why don't we go ahead and recruit our ai, uh, AI? <laughs> our um, recruiting units so let's go on we'll do this recruit new army oops um i want it in tennessee this one so this is going to be our not under him though no. Who can be the commander of this recruiting force? I don't think it makes a huge amount of difference. We can't assign Cooper or Robert E. Lee because they're full generals. These are just core size armies, remember? Uh, Albert Sidney Johnson, obviously, he's going to get a proper command. Um, we just need someone. Yeah, maybe he'll do, actually. Donaldson. He's political as well. Is he from Texas, this guy? He's actually from Tennessee, so yeah, let's get him in there. So that's Donaldson, uh, Donaldson with the Department of the West. I'm not going to do a whole heap of recruiting. We're just going to recruit a small unit just to make sure it stays on the map. 1,500 men from Georgia. Bait. He's pretty good, actually. And a political officer. So, yeah, he's fine there. Um, so, we'll just recruit 1,500 men in here. And maybe some artillery. Let's try this out, actually, the artillery. 45, 67 on 90. Let's go with a 67 man a battery and i'm not sure how many guns you get for that does it does it even tell you let's see if we can find an artillery guy to take charge deering yeah he's pretty good okay so this is the begins of our little recruitment force the department of the west where are they memphis that's absolutely fine 
Uh, we don't need one in the Trans Mississippi just yet because we're not going. We're not going on offensive operations. Uh, the East, though, we will want one. We'll want one probably at, like at Richmond, Virginia. We'll just call out the Virginia HQ. Let's replace Albert Sidney Johnston. Let's get Pemberton in there. He's crap, and he's got uh, administration three, so you know he's fine. That's he can be a oh, Virginia HQ man. He's not really going to be fighting or anything like that. Let's see where they spawn. Uh, actually, nowhere because I didn't put any troops into it. Okay. You always have to add troops to the to the HQs and stuff to make sure that they actually appear. Let's do this again. Virginia. Pemberton. No troops available from Virginia. Let's stick in 1,500 men from North Carolina. Yeah, Iverson, he'll do. We'll also go with some guns. Always handy to have some guns. We'll go with a 90-man unit, the bigger one. Uh, Kemper? He's fine for that. All right, so that's that. Where did they spawn then? Let's see. Not ideal. We're just about ready to actually start the campaign here. Oof. So he's recruiting straight up to 41,000 men into there. And 21,000 into the Department of Pennsylvania. Okay, so that we're going to be up for a, a fight almost immediately here. Uh, in fact, well, I'm sure we will be in for a fight immediately because that's how this normally goes. Uh, McDowell will come down supported by Patterson or not, one or the other. But usually McDowell comes down. In fact, I think he's already on the march because... Is that what it means when you can see the troops on the map? Maybe. I mean, we can see ours, but his look a bit more stretched out. There's only 18,753 men here under Beauregard. Historically, of course, what happened, I'm sure most of you guys know, um, Patterson and his Department of Pennsylvania was supposed to keep Joe Johnson occupied and stuck in the northern Shenandoah Valley. However, Joe Johnson decided not to stick around, left... Um, Patterson twiddling his thumbs around here in the Northern Valley and he simply pushed across by train and joined Beauregard for the fight at Bull Run which as we all know was a Confederate victory um, and Patterson ended up getting fired for that I mean quite right as well as far as I'm concerned but anyway <laughs> so there's that okay so we've got the army set up we've got the beginnings of a recruiting system in place um, now a thing we need to do is have a look at the Navy. We've got a few ships in harbour, nothing huge. The CSS Virginia is being built. Uh, that's an ironclad. Casemate, ironclad ram. So it's a, it's a very powerful ship that will hopefully run riot once we get that built up. We've got a couple of these steamers ready to put out um, into the fleets. In terms of fleets, we haven't really got anything amazing <laughs> worth shouting about um so the new orleans squadron steamers mostly a couple of what's this cotton clad ram a timber clad gunboat and a schooner it's, a, it's, it's not a very powerful fleet charleston squadron that is a ship's tender gunboat and that's it mobile squadron two schooners i mean again what, what's that going to do <laughs> nothing the Savannah Squadron, a handful of steamers and a, and a schooner. The Texas Maritime Department, again, it's a schooner and a ship's tender gun, but just the smallest ship you can buy uh, with two guns. <laughs> I mean, you can see it's clearly not going to do anything against the Union's frigates and whatnot. Uh, again, here, tiny. But another cotton clad ram actually in there. That's good. North Carolina squadron, four ships, three of them are ships tenders, and one's the mortar schooner, three guns. So, like, the Confederate Navy is tiny. We will need to expand the Confederate Navy. We'll need to work on that for sure. 
Our main aim with the Navy is to try and disrupt the blockading squadrons where possible. The James River squadron here, four ships, so we're not really going to do that much with those guys. Mostly, I think we're just going to hang out and stay safe behind the forts for now. We'll do a little bit of shipbuilding, but we, we've got to watch our finances. With these new updates, the finances are really important. It's important to get it right. It's important not to overspend. And uh, yeah, so like, you've got to watch what you're doing, basically. I'm just going to shift the Texas Maritime Squadron up into the mouth of the Mississippi. So they'll be protected from enemy shipping by these forts, which should blast anybody who tries to come up the river, and it means we won't lose them to fighting. Uh, well, hopefully, anyway. <laughs> we'll find out. I mean, we might. It's, it's a risk. Uh, yeah, so that's the plan. We're going to have to fight the blockade a little bit. We're going to have to try and keep finances as good as possible. It's not, I mean, we're going to, finances are going to tumble. We're going to recruit a lot of troops. But one of my plans for this series is maybe we're going to spend a little less on weapons, particularly rifles, early game. So we're, one, we're going to make do with what we've got. We might go with legacy rifles or maybe reboard muskets. You know, we'll go with those kind of cheaper options for, for the, to start with. Um, and branch out into better weapons as the game goes on. But I think that's enough talking here i think surely you've had enough of listening to me waffling on about this game <laughs> i hope that uh, well if anything's not clear then drop it in the comments of course i'm happy to explain anything if i can uh <clears throat> in terms of in terms of uh you know gameplay and stuff like that um first thing i'm going to do i'm going to move magruder up here towards fredericksburg i'm going to get him to build a fort he can be our the hampton division can be our little building force for now and we're going to bring the army of the Shenandoah across to support Joe Johnson when he comes down basically that's that's what we're going to do all right so let's get started here we're starting the civil war civil war further southern states secede confederate armies on the move Europeans reluctant to take sides Yeah, so you can see he's moving straight down there. We're going to switch him to defensive mode. I mean, I'm not sure if he'll get the orders before McDowell reaches us, but he might. Or maybe they aren't coming. I'm not sure. Uh, so yeah, we took Militia Act 2. It's going to be 25 days for that. And we're going to do the majority of our recruiting once this is done. I may have to do a little bit beforehand because, like we say, he's already moving up substantially but um it looks like he's actually pulling up to the north so I'm, I'm not entirely sure what he's doing i mean like i say i have no idea what to expect from the ai here i'm going to recruit a brigade straight into the army of the northwest i know i would usually use um recruiting units but i don't think we need that at the moment We've got troops from West Virginia, but with 35 support, I'm not going to recruit those guys. Maryland, 31 support. We'll, we'll leave those well alone. But let's go with uh, an infantry brigade from Alabama. 1,500 men. Yeah, nice. Kershaw, that's fine. So once the Hampton Division gets up here to Fredericksburg and captures the town, we'll build a fort here and we'll build a hospital here. So that's going to help us with wounded recovery. I mean, there's going to be a lot of fighting in Virginia, as well, I'm expecting a lot of fighting anyway, so I'm sure surely there will be. So Joe Johnson has come across. Uh, the Virginia HQ is on the move. That's our recruiting unit, remember. But it seems actually he hasn't come down at all. Patterson is pushing down into the valley instead. So it leaves us immediately with a problem. This is the way it should have worked as well, historically, obviously. like It's given this confederacy a conundrum. Do you bring your armies together and outnumber 
the army of northeastern Virginia? Or do you fight two battles outnumbered, basically? Because we're going to be outnumbered if we fight separately. Something we can do, we could move him out of here and bring Garnett up to this area. But I mean, it's a tiny force, but then we could bring Joe Johnston out to fight Patterson. And we wouldn't be quite as outnumbered. <laughs> Still reasonably outnumbered. But actually, so before we play on, I'm going to give out some weapons. We're going to have a look at these weapons, actually. Mississippi rifles for Bonham. Mixed muskets. I think it's probably mixed muskets for most people. Oh, Mississippi rifles for Evans as well. Six pound field guns. Oh, right, so it tells you the guns at the top there. I didn't notice that before when I was looking. Um, mixed muskets. Yeah, so mixed muskets suck a lot. At least two of these guys got Mississippi, so that's good news. I'm going to give one of Walker's division some rifles as well if you've got some let's have a look what have we actually got 6,000 Springfield rifle muskets 3,000 Mississippi rifles we've got some proper Springfield muskets as well which are better than the mixed muskets and what else and that's it actually that's it yeah let's go ahead we'll give out some Springfield rifle muskets for these guys and we're going to give out Springfield muskets to some of the rest The Springfield Musket is not a lot better, but it is a little better than the Mixed Muskets. Let's have a look at the guns. What have we got? We've got nothing. <laughs> We've got eight 24-pound howitzers and 12 16-pound field guns. Now, a 16-pound field gun is not good. Uh, a 12-pound field gun, even. We've got 16 12-pound field guns. A 12-pound field gun is not good, but it's a lot better than a 6-pound field gun. Joe Johnson's Army of the Shenandoah. Let's have a look. Barnet B has got rifles. The rest of the guys have got mixed muskets and we've got six pound field guns. Whoa. That is not much to be getting on with. Our Trans Mississippi guys, let's have a quick look at those dudes. That's mixed muskets all around and a six pound field gun. Let's replace a Bledsoe. He looks not good. <laughs> uh, Matthias W. Henry let's go with him there you go son do we have any cab weapons we've got some Springfield Muscatoons and Maynard Carbines 500 of them I think that means we've got enough to give out the Jeb Stewart's unit let's just have a quick check of that uh -huh. only 300 men in that unit Let's give the Maynards out. Mixed muskets for this cavalry unit, okay. And six pound field guns. So, like, weapons are definitely a problem here. Um, enemy blockades, okay. So, some pretty good blockades going on here. Like we knew there would be. Gonna return these guys to port. Hopefully they'll keep out of trouble.
so they're coming together here. They're coming together at Washington. That's okay. At least they're not coming into the Shenandoah Valley. Price at his, at his destination. Okay, so we need to build up a supply base here, which we're going to make at Fayetteville. Five million that costs. Like I said, we're going to build a fort on the river at Nashville if we can. It's something. Oh, there, that'll do. Thirteen million for that fort, so they're not cheap, not at all. <laughs> So it costs three and a half million to build a prison camp. Two point three million for a news agency, a news agency, a market which improves uh, movement of goods and things like that. It costs two point three million. So it's all pretty expensive stuff. A bank we can't actually build one. Hospital three point five million, expensive. The Hampton Division has taken Fredericksburg, which is what we wanted. Um, we're going to build a fort here, which is hopefully going to stop the Union from just marching over. I'm not going to be hugely building forts all over the place, but we, I think we need a few. Eleven million for that one. And we're also going to build a hospital here. Right. We've got Bragg's Army of Florida moving up to join Polk at Nashville. And from there, we're going to start pushing up into Kentucky. So Fort Pulaski's got these artillery guys in there. And we're going to move them out to one of the armies. Because quite frankly, I don't think we need them in there. Fort Macon also has 12 pound Napoleons. And again, I don't think we need them there. So let's we're going to bring them across into the field armies. I mean, we could recruit a tiny little unit to go in here, I suppose. For Johnson, they've also got 12 pound Napoleons. Let's get them out of there. All right. So that's quite handy to get a few of these Napoleons out into the armies, I feel like. I don't think it's a mistake. I, I think that's it's, it's, a, it's a good way to do it. I've actually changed my mind though, I'm going to change this to three divisions. So, interesting, Barksdale stays a colonel as a division commander. That didn't used to happen, they used to get bumped straight up. Maybe that's something else new. Alright, well anyway. Change that to three division structure. 
time is ticking on. The Union has not pressed down into Virginia yet. Maybe they're waiting for those recruits to come. Maybe they're not, because the army of Northeastern Virginia has moved into the Shenandoah Valley. So we're going to move across to see if we can meet them. I think it makes sense to fight them when they're separated from the Department of Pennsylvania. Why is this flip the Union? Why is Beauregard not moving as well? It's, anyway. Okay, so we've got the first battle of the war here. <clears throat> even numbers. Or fairly even anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to leave the episode right here. We're going to do the next episode. I'll release it as soon as I can after this. I'll record the episode separate though because it's going to be a real long one otherwise. Uh, it's going to be the Battle of Bull Run, but not really. It's obviously on the other side of Virginia, uh, on the other side of the river there. And it's going to be an interesting fight. It's our first fight for 1.07. How is it going to go? Are we going to be able to beat them? Uh, who knows? Army of the Shenandoah, the Army of the Potomac. We're going to take on the Army of Northeastern Virginia. Joe Johnston versus McDowell. All right, then. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe if you like this sort of content. There's regular content on this channel. Uh, I try to release at least a video every weekday. Occasionally at weekends as well, but uh, sometimes I'm busy at weekends. But usually there's a video every single day on this channel of this sort of content. Uh, I like, obviously, strategy gaming, historical gaming. I love the Civil War and the American Civil War. Um, and if you like this video, please leave a like. If you're interested in anything further, Drop it in the comments. If you've got anything to say about the episode, drop it in the comments. Let me know what you think of it. Have you been playing 1.07? What do you think of it? Anyway, whatever you're doing, have yourself a great day, and I'll see you in the next episode. Ta-ra for now.